Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Mas Ma Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts elders past, present, and future, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we make our work. We acknowledge the truth of the violence perpetrated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. Thank you for being here. Uh, happy Monday. Uh, Shana Tova, to those who are celebrating Rosh Hashanah and may not be here with us tonight. Hopefully they can tune in later. Um, and welcome to this event, uh, The Power of the Commons with David Bollier. We're so happy to have you here. Um, this event is hosted in partnership with the Center for Economic Democracy, the Emerson Engagement Lab, and the Emerson MA in Media Design. So I would like to really thank our partners, Paul, Ariel, for, for your help in that. And for those who I haven't met, my name is Jamie Galoon. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the director and a co-founder of HowlRound Theatre Commons. Uh, HowlRound Theatre Commons is based here at Emerson in the Office of the Arts. We are a free and open platform for theatre makers worldwide. We amplify progressive and disruptive ideas about theater and facilitate connection between diverse practitioners. I also want to say hello to those who may be tuning in online because we are live streaming this event on HowlRound TV. Um, we ask anyone as a result who's speaking throughout the evening to use a microphone because it will help those who are tuning in online. Um, when we get to the Q&A portion of tonight, we'll have mic runners and we'll try to make it as easy as possible and we appreciate your patience with that. Um, you'll also notice that we are live captioning this event as part of our ongoing accessibility efforts. So HowlRound Theatre Commons is a digital knowledge commons and all of our content is, uh, is produced, uh, peer produced, and we license everything through the Creative Commons. Um, the Commons, thank you. <laughs> the Commons is uh, near and dear to our heart. It's really a, a primary organizing principle of all of our work. And um, David Bullier, who we're lucky to have with us here tonight, is um, someone who's been deeply influential in our thinking. Um, we have read some of his previous books, such as Think Like a Commoner and Patterns of Commoning, and been really inspired by um, his deep knowledge and his belief that um, arts and culture have a, a really important role to play um, in the commons and are already doing so. Um, we first met David in 2015, and we have been working with him and other arts and culture organizations in an arts, culture, and commoning working group for the last year and a half plus. Um, and tonight, we couldn't be more delighted to have him here to talk about his new book, Free, Fair, and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Commons. So I'm going to introduce David now. You have a short bio um, in your program as well. So David is an American activist, scholar, and blogger who is focused on the commons as a new paradigm for reimagining economics, politics, and culture. He pursues this work as director of the Reinventing the Commons program at the Schumacher Center for, the, for a New Economics and as co-founder of the Commons Strategies Group, an international advocacy project. Bollier has co-organized pioneering international conferences and strategy workshops on the commons and consults regularly with diverse activists and policy experts in the US and Europe. His blog, bollier.org, is a widely read source of news about the commons and his book, Think Like a Commoner, A Short Introduction to the Life of the Commons, has been translated into six languages. Bollier is an editor and author of many books on the commons, including Patterns of Commoning and The Wealth of the Commons, both with co-editor Silke Helfrich. Green Governance, co-authored with the late Professor Burns Weston, and Viral Spiral, brand name Bullies, and Silent Theft. In 2012, Bollier received the Bosch Berlin Prize in Public Policy from the, Ameri from the American Academy in Berlin for his work on the commons. Bollier lives in Amherst, Massachusetts. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mike here? Well, it's, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Jamie, and thank you, <laughs> thank you, HowlRound staff for helping pull this together, as well as the partners on this project. I'm really grateful to have this, uh, this opportunity to have a conversation with you about the commons. Um, I need my 
This book was, is the result of um, about three years of work with my German activist, scholar, friend, and colleague, Silke Helfrich. And uh, we, after both of us being involved in the commons internationally for, oh, I'd say uh, 10 or 15 years at the time, now it's almost 20, uh, we decided we needed to sort of debrief each other on the commons in a way that a lot of the academic literature and certainly the economic literature didn't make clear. So my talk is the result of that, and uh, I hope to suggest how there's all sorts of system change that's possible by learning to think like a commoner, and that's what I will try to present today. We start with, I think, the idea that free markets and the whole capitalist narrative is starting to fray. It's, it's proving dysfunctional, especially since the 2008 financial crisis. Its stories just are not credible anymore. And this is allied with uh, the state not performing in the way that it has historically purported to uh, in terms of meeting needs, in terms of wealth inequality, in terms of dealing with climate change, which has been documented for more than 30 years, in terms of dealing with a whole cascade of other social problems in reactive ways or not at all. And we like to, Silk and I like to call it the market state system because while we often talk about the state and the market as opponents, in a very deeper level, they're very allied in their vision for what kind of a society we should have and how to achieve it through economic growth, through technological innovation, and all the things that the capitalist narrative uh, provides in conjunction with state power. But as I suggested, the capitalist storylines are starting to fall apart. And this is leaving, I think, a void in our political life and cultural life that has, to the moment, been filled with a lot of right-wing authoritarians and, uh, well, what the French scholar Bruno Latour calls epistemological delirium. We don't have some consensual ways for understanding the world. And I'd like to suggest, whoops, I'd like to pose the question, can the commons help us imagine new pathways for growing a new world? And this is necessary particularly because so much discourse is uh, fixed in this rut of, well, do we want capitalism or do we want socialism? And the, it's almost fixated on that, even though I think both arguments are somewhat artifacts of another era and don't speak to some of the realities of our time. It's because of this rut we're in, we often say, well, the state and the market are the only two consequential ways for governing things or producing things we need. And the idea of the commons is dismissed as an archaic relic of medieval times if, and no longer really relevant to our times. And that's what I'd like to suggest is uh, misguided and we need to revisit. Part, one reason this has persisted so long is because we've had this idea of the tragedy of the commons, which many of you, it's been drilled into most of us. Many of you may remember it was a 1968 essay by biologist Garrett Hardin who said, well, imagine a pasture in which anyone can put as many cattle as they want on it. It will result in the overgrazing and ruination of the commons, the tragedy. And this has been embraced by property rights advocates and conservatives and politicians and most undergraduate, undergraduate professors as this self-evident tale, which is really kind of a parable. But there's lots of embedded political assumptions in this. As Lewis Hyde, the scholar, puts it, it's the tragedy of unmanaged, laissez-faire common pool resources with easy access for non-communicating, self-interested individuals. <laughs> it, it, it's really kind of this libertarian uh, fantasy or at least these are buried within that story. Because in truth, Hardin was not describing a commons. He was describing an open access regime or a free for all in which anybody can take whatever they want and there's no community, there's no governance, there's no uh, rules or punishment of those who break the rules, which is really the definition of a commons. Which is why I really like to call this the tragedy of the market because that's more accurately, that more accurately describes what happens when people have no uh, peer governance to constrain themselves. And it was Professor Eleanor Ostrom, an Indiana University professor who uh, over the course of her life through 
the 70s, 80s, 90s, until her death in 2012, helped really empirically rebut this story through rather exhaustive field work and creative theorizing. This book, uh, Governing the Commons, was her 1990 uh, landmark piece, which was one reason she won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her pioneering work. And uh, it was interesting that it was 2009 because it was the year after the 2008 financial crisis. And I like to think the Nobel Prize Committee wanted somebody a little bit different th that year, somebody who thought that cooperation might actually be consequential in economic affairs, which is what her, her work was chiefly about. And also, as the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, I think it was significant that she was more attuned to relationality as being important in economics than the standard categories of standard economic thought. But the, the big takeaway from her work is that the commons is not just a resource. It's a self-organized social system. It's a community plus the resource, plus the social norms and practices. And so, you know, it's, it's more than just a resource, and actually it's more than just sharing and cooperation. It's kind of a social system or institution for getting things done, which is why her work was so uh, really pioneering. Now, one reason I think enclosures have become, or commons have become more prominent in our consciousness in the past, say, five or seven years, is because enclosures are increasing. Now, enclosures happen frequently when global capital wants free and subsidized resources and they don't want, want any trouble from commoners. So they often ally themselves with the state to help take possession of shared wealth. And this is happening uh, really uh, across the board, not just in the US, but internationally. I'll give you a few examples. I don't want to dwell on enclosures, but it's important to realize this is an important part of the story. There's a great international land grab going on where uh, sovereign, hedge, sovereign uh, investment funds, hedge funds, and many others are taking over lands in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and evicting the traditional communities or indigenous peoples there. It's really kind of a replay of the English enclosure movement of the 17th and 18th centuries, causing all these people to be basically dispossessed, having to move into the cities, look for work, often unsuccessfully, and so forth. This is happening right now. It's a major setup for famine and all sorts of uh, social problems. 20% of the human genome is currently uh, privately owned through patents. And this has all sorts of consequences for scientists who may be reluctant to investigate, for example, the breast cancer susceptibility gene, because until a Supreme Court decision, it was pretty much locked up in a patent. Um, the copywriting and trademarking of folk culture, which Disney is quite famous for, uh, maybe most famous for, but not, certainly not the only one who is colonizing all sorts of uh, social culture and then making it private property. One of my favorites is how in the 1990s, the music collecting society ASCAP started dunning uh, hundreds of campfires, or, uh, campfire girls and summer camps for singing around the campfire, because of course, singing around the campfire is a public performance for which you should pay a copyright. And they wanted everyone to pay a blanket licensing fee for it. They were eventually rebuffed after the public uh, got wind of this through the news. But another example of how market enclosures and property rights are stretching extremely far. It goes in many other realms, uh, which we could talk extensively about, but uh, this is one reason I think a lot of people are saying, we have some shared wealth that we ought to be controlling, and people want to push back. So there's the surge of what I call a new old system. I think it's new or newly discovered. It's old in the sense that it goes, I think, as part of the human condition of being a cooperative species, as uh, Sam Bowles uh, has written in a book of that title. Interestingly, just two weeks ago, the Economist magazine, that bastion of capitalist uh, uh, cheerleading, wrote an article saying, whose it said be something like an alternative to nationalization and privatization, and it's the commons. I was utterly shocked. The subtitle was, more public resources could be managed as commons without much loss of efficiency. Uh, check it out. 
so I, I was really pleased to hear that there's some movement uh, going on. But let me just give you a quick review of some commons so you have some reference points to think about the commons. In fact, about two billion people survive, uh, not just uh, bear survival, but often quite nicely, through subsistence commons of forest, fisheries, farmland, irrigation water, wild game, and many other things around the world. And this is not interesting to economists, however, because there's no market transactions going on. There's no cash being exchanged necessarily. And so it's largely dismissed as not significant or bare survival and we, we've got to do better. Now, to be sure, all these people are not doing great, but it's also true that it is the basis of a stable, ecologically benign mode of meeting needs that's not necessarily through conventional or transnational markets. Here in the global north, uh, there's a lot of local food sovereignty movements going on, which are trying to mimic the same process of gaining more local control over the provisioning of food uh, through local, uh, new types of local or regional food chains. And this is, of course, a very robust uh, thing going on right now with many manifestations from CSA farms to permaculture to even rethinking the whole value chain of, of regional food provisioning, such as the, the Fresno Commons. In Europe especially, especially in global cities that have become overrun with global capital as Airbnb uh, hollows out neighborhoods and uh, speculative investment takes place uh, to buy up entire buildings. Uh, there's a movement of this to approach the city as a commons to reclaim the city for the people who live there. This is seen in such things as urban land trusts and community gardens. Uh, there's even efforts to get municipal data systems. The city of Linz, Austria has a whole open commons, Linz, to make government information available and to give people free uh, server space and, and uh, email service. So there's a lot of efforts to reclaim cities as the basis of, of the commons. And I find this a very encouraging development for developing a different vision for cities than we're seeing in many places. One part of this in some cities is developing alternative currencies. And the, the idea is that the value that's created within that community can be captured and recirculated rather than being siphoned away to absentee banks who may or may not care very much about that community. Uh, I associated with the uh, Schumacher Center for New Economics, which pioneered the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And that's been just a very catalytic kind of uh, way to rebuild community identity while reinvigorating the local economy. Oops. Um, the web is not often, we associate the web so often with Facebook or Twitter or social media, the corporate side of it, but we also need to think of it really as a hosting infrastructure for commons because the barriers to using it as commons are very minimal uh, as we've seen in such uh, famous examples as Wikipedia. But Creative Commons has helped facilitate this by providing a kind of legal infrastructure for the legal sharing of things automatically, which inverts the natural presumption of copyright that everything should be born private property so that it could be marketized. Creative Commons licenses allows copyright holders to use a variety of open public free licenses to uh, stipulate how their work can be shared and copied and reused for free in advance. A part of this whole movement is the open source movement, which many of you are no doubt familiar with, which has it, it transformed software and a lot of the infrastructure of, of uh, online life, uh, creating a whole, a whole class of decommodified software and functionalities that aren't dependent upon big tech. So I think this is a significant de development in the commons world. But then now there's a whole nother generation of innovation on top of that, which a number of people refer to as Cosmo local production, where knowledge, which is light and easy to share, is shared on these global communities, and then local production can occur more cheaply in modular ways, in ways that can be modified at the local level. So for example, with FarmHack or a project called Open Source Ecology, there's a lot of agricultural equipment that is not patented that can be reused by farmers in lots of different contexts. This is especially important in 
in a lot of uh, poor Global South context. There's actually a Wikispeed car that was designed in a similar fashion. Arduino is a lot of uh, electronic circuit boards and other electronic equipment that is openly shareable. They claim a trademark on certain materials, but people can still copy and, and replicate uh, the equipment. And of course, fab labs and maker spaces are really engines for a lot of these kinds of innovations as well. But when you get right down to it, there's no inventory of commons, master inventory. They can arise anywhere. Look at HowlRound. Who would have thought a feeder could become a commons? And you know, they've pioneered uh, ways in which regional, non-commercial, and uh, various ethnically oriented theater, Latinx common, commons, can uh, function through commoning. About, more about that in a moment. There's a Wi-Fi system in Catalonia that has more than 22,000 modes, nodes, which is, functions as a commons. There's the open source seed initiative that's trying to deal with patented seeds uh, by assuring that certain seeds will not be able to be taken private. The Potato Park in Peru, indigenous peoples having control over a vast region to, uh, to, main, to be stewards of the biodiversity of potatoes there. So there's many, many places where commons pop up. The point is any community can do it when they decide they want to manage something in an inclusive, fair, participatory way outside of the market and state. With a, a sort of uh, note to the artistic world, I want to cite a couple of another, the Powerhouse Productions and the Hinterlands in Detroit are areas, are two projects in which uh, they self-consciously uh, see themselves as doing a lot of commenting with their community uh, itself. Their art and the community are directly involved. Just as in Providence, Rhode Island, AS220, they own some buildings that they basically got the sweat equity from over decades, and now they are able to use their equity to provide artist-driven, artist-centered projects from printmaking to performance to exhibitions and so on. So it, it inverts a lot of the models of petitioning for foundations or corporations for money by having some control over their artistic uh, life. But now I want to get to the point where we get a little more uh, focused on how does the inside of the commons work after all? We know we have a lot of narratives about economics and homo economicus were uh, you know, rational utility maximizing materialist and so forth. How do we see and understand the commons in its own terms? I think that's really an important challenge and a, a major focus of my book with Silke Helfrich. And one thing we started to realize and as we did our research was that uh, old dated worldviews are often major impediments to seeing how things really are. And we came, I live in Amherst, and we came across the story of uh, Edward Hitchcock, who was a famous geologist in the 1840s. And he came across all these fossilized footprints in sandstone in the region and was trying to hypothesize, well, what could they be? And he thought they were giant birds or turkeys. Uh, but in fact, uh, and this, this was because the word dinosaur had not been invented. Darwin had not published The uh, Origin of the Species. And he was still in a biblical worldview that uh, there wasn't such thing as deep time or, or something like that. So we saw a kind of an example with him of how a, an old worldview just couldn't, you couldn't take cognizance of new evidence in new ways. And I think today we're approaching a similar kind of inflection point where the, the market capitalist story is just misstating a lot of evidence or not capturing a lot. It still thinks that value is best defined by price and money and that progress is really about commodifying and privatizing things and that free trade really should be about extraction of resources. And Costs, of course, should be externalized as if there is an outside in a finite planet. So I think we're grappling right now with some limited perspectives that we need to find a way to get around uh, an update. And I'd like to propose that commenting is a way to help understand some of these phenomena in a better way and in a more humane, civilized, socially constructive way. We start by saying that commenting is generative and value creating. It's far from a tragedy. Uh, 
It's just that we're not necessarily monetizing the value that's created. And this, you have to understand that it represents a different worldview, ethos, and operational logic. And that's why I think the commons is frequently misconstrued because it, it takes a lot of work to sort of uh, appreciate some of these other perspectives. From, from my perspective, the commons is about bottom-up experimentation that's very practical. It's not an ideological or totalistic scheme. It's a very situated and rooted in the local context, the history, the geography, the culture of that community. And the historian Peter Leinbaugh has put it nicely. He says, the common, there is no commons without commoning, which means the, really the verb, the activity by which a community works together, negotiates with each other, finds ways to sustainably manage something, that's the real focus, the, the relational process, not the noun of the commons, the way it's traditionally approached. And in my studies of, of really scores of commons, I see that there's a whole different universe of values that are being represented by the commons than, again, standard economics. It's about fairness and it's about responsibility by people have that's yoked to entitlements that they receive and long-term stewardship. It's about meeting basic needs and not simply wants or profits. And a key idea is the inalienability and decommodification, that certain things are not for sale, shouldn't be for sale, and that they're more valuable being protected to have access and use on a non-market way. It's about participation. And custom and tradition are often kind of the moral and practical gyroscope for keeping a commons uh, ongoing and persistent. So a lot of this means learning to see the commons and commoning as about relationality and value as a living phenomena, which is why the title of our book is Free, Fair, and Alive. This is about something we're constantly having to renegotiate and live with. It's about our relationships with each other, our relationships with the earth. It's about our intergenerational relationships with our ancestors and with our future. But getting to this um, perspective requires letting go of some old concepts. As we worked, as Silk and I worked in our book, we realized that certain words we just were not incorrect, but they somehow were laden with some wrong valences of meaning. For example, the word resources, I kind of choke on these days because it always implies <coughs> something other apart from me that's ready to be bought and sold. And in fact, I have a lot of relation, I have a lot of uh, memories or emotional connections or sometimes an entire culture has a connection with certain quote resources. So there were a lot of words that I found were not quite right in talking about the commons. And so we wanted to invent some new words. For example, we talk about care wealth, which has a different category of meaning than a resource. And instead of talking about the individual, as economists talk about it, we talk about the nested eye because we're nested in these larger communities that we're both beholden to and shape us. Um, we talked about Ubuntu rationality. This is a South African Bantu term for I am because we are. And Ubuntu rationality is about aligning individual and collective needs together as opposed to assuming that the individual needs are paramount and trump everything else, and so on. So these are some of the words that we use to try to name this. Um, there's a video here that I could tell you about. It'll be online soon, but this is my co-author, Silka. We often had little periods where we had to come up with a word to invent, to name things that have gone unnamed or that the conventional discourse simply doesn't recognize. And I think that this is an important it's not just for its own sake. It's about having a precision and a collective language object to orient ourselves around. And part of this is, I think, also about acknowledging our inner life. Uh, I've struggled with how to convey how the commons w flows through us and changes us, changes me. And this is how the West looks at the Great Sandy Desert in Australia. And this is how the Aborigines see it and it's the same territory. And it sort of suggests a, a far more 
deeper emotional, even spiritual connection with a, a quote resource. And so I just wanted to use that as a little placeholder for how commons have meaning. It's a meaning making process in a way that uh, I don't often find my economic relationships don't, don't uh, have. And when you, get, when you get right down to it, a commons is about world making, which is a term a lot of sociologists and anthropologists are using a lot these days. Uh, it's not just for indigenous or traditional communities. I think you know, online communities are creating a world. And in many respects, this world needs to be honored. I see it being about a politics of belonging. It's about an economics of sufficiency. And it's about a culture that decommodifies and shares. And this, these are some uh, stakes in the ground that help you see how it's a different perspective on the world. So in our book, we talk about patterns of commoning. And the reason is um, we were inspired by Christopher Alexander. Some of you may know is this kind of dissenting uh, architect and urban designer who was also a mathematician, is also a mathematician and philosopher. He's quite old now. But he developed what he's, what's called pattern languages, which is a methodology for looking at phenomena and seeing regularities without saying that they're all uh, universal and the same. So he looked at you know, why are certain design patterns in buildings and urban spaces so recurrent across cultures and history? And his answer was because they serve certain important human needs, both inner life as well as socially. And we used his methodology for studying actual common. So it was a practice-based methodology. We were just not making stuff up here to uh, look at commons and, decide and learn what patterns they might have. And we developed what we call the triad of commoning, which consists of three major categories, social life, provisioning, and peer governance. And these are all, of course, interrelated, but they're different angles on the same phenomena of commoning. And I won't go through all the different patterns, but for, we, had a, we came up with about 28 patterns. And I might add, this is an open-ended, evolving process. These are not necessarily the be-all, end-all patterns, but they were the ones that we identified. Since completing the book, we've even concluded that, you know, it might be worthwhile to have a whole set of patterns dealing with law in the commons, and another one having to do with the commons in our inner life. But I mean, that's the beauty of patterns. It's, it doesn't purport to be universalistic uh, in the sense that not every commons has all of these, but these tend to be present in many of them. And I'll just, the, I've put these in, uh, in bigger types so you could see some of them to get a sense. So for example, with peer governance, you want to assure commoners consent and decision making. You want to ensure transparency in a sphere of trust, which is different from transparency where there's not trust because then you simply disclose as little as possible. Whereas the point is to get as much as you can shared so that you can react more intelligently and so on. Uh, dealings with money and markets are especially important in the commons because markets tend to colonize the community and the resources managed by commons. And so it's important to try to keep those uh, separate. So we, have, uh, we think it's very important to keep commons and uh, commerce distinct. And we like to, we've invented a category of certain property where it's relationalized, meaning it's not simply something that is totally excluded but people have a social relationship with the property that matters. Uh, and this helps maintain access and control by a large group of people, as opposed to, say, a nonprofit board of directors who might decide that they want to shut it down or liquidate the asset. So we, we've wanted to get into this type of detail. The same with provisioning. We use provisioning instead of production, because production, of course, means you have to have a consumer. But in a commons, provisioning is production and consumption is integrated, uh, and we think provisioning is a better way to describe that. Um, and then, of course, the social life of commoning matters. Do you cultivate shared purpose and value? How do you strengthen the nested eye? Well, one, re one way is through ritualizing togetherness, through fun, through festivals, through parties, through events. 
And there's a practice of gentle reciprocity. It's not the kind of even st Stephen quid pro quo uh, relationship of the market. It's like you give to the commons and you will receive benefits in turn, but it's in an indirect reciprocity as opposed to a strict direct reciprocity. And we like to think that these ideas of comedy start at the micro level. We can do this anytime we want, but that like a seed, it works out, it can manifest itself at the meso level through different types of infrastructures and at the macro level through new types of institutions at very large levels, including uh, state-based commons public partnerships instead of just the private um, public-private partnerships, which are often a, an excuse for raiding the public treasury, commons public partnerships use the resources of government, law, law, finance, technical assistance to help people common in their own right on their own terms. And an inevitable issue, which is too complicated to go into here, is about state power, because we know how formidable state power is. We know uh, that it is often jealous of its authority. But I take some consolation from an encouragement from Hannah Arendt's quote, power springs up between people when they meet and act, when they act together and vanish the moment they disperse. Meaning when you get together as a commons, it has a potential political implication uh, because it provides uh, a certain moral authority and ability to do things that has larger repercussions. We can see this in the way, for example, Linux has become very influential, the way the slow food and uh, local food movements have become very influential by withdrawing from some of the circuits of the state and capital to develop um, functional alternatives with their own moral integrity. Uh, that's a kind of power in its own right. People ask me often, how do you scale the commons and build the commons verse? Well, Instead of talking about scale, which implies centralization and hierarchy, I prefer to talk about emulating and federating. We can keep the appropriate scale and its rootedness, but then we can federate uh, among them and co-learn from each other and coordinate and still have a significant impact. And either by ourselves or with the state, we can develop infrastructures which are designed to encourage commoning as opposed to simply market exchange. And we can develop these sorts of uh, state-based partnerships, which um, I think are especially productive at the municipal level, perhaps more problematic for the, for the moment at uh, national or international levels. But who knows? I'm always being surprised. Um, I think one takeaway from all this for me is the next big thing will be a lot of small things. And uh, David Fleming, this uh, British, uh, political thinker said that really uh, large problems don't need large scale solutions. They need, they require small solutions with big pick, large uh, frameworks for action. And I like to see that the commons provides a large framework for coordinating a huge number of diverse types of small scale actions and showing that they have a kinship and that they're aligned towards a similar goal while retaining their integrity at appropriate scale uh, action. And fortunately, there are today many champions of small scale solutions working within their own traditions and geographies, which I think have a lot of potential for adding up to a significant impact in ways that the uh, centralized leviathans of states uh, often have trouble, particularly trouble doing, particularly since they have their own legitimacy and trust issues they're grappling with today. So I see small scale, bottom up, people driven solutions as having a huge amount of promise if we can align them properly and get them pulling in the right direction, the same direction. So with that, I'd like to have a larger conversation uh, facilitated by uh, our moderator, Paul. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming this evening. And uh, David, thank you for that talk. Um, so what I'd like to do is maybe offer a few insights, and then uh, we will turn it to the audience to have questions.
uh, and hopefully some discussion into the reception. So, um, uh, and uh, just for context, my name is Paul Mihailidis, and I'm, I'm here, a professor at Emerson College, and uh, my work aligns a lot with what you said, uh, and this was a really uh, inspiring talk, and I think a lot, of, a lot to chew on. So, um, I have a few things that I thought might help frame the conversation for us. Um, you mentioned the markets and the state. A lot of times we look at those. Maybe this could be one place to start a conversation. You mentioned the market and state as, as oftentimes seen as um, in opposition to one another or, or regulating each other. But if you look down into it, uh, oftentimes when put together, they, they almost constrain the commons. And I wonder if you could um, just talk a little bit about uh, how that uh, how they're actually working in concert more to uh, either interfere, constrain, or if I'm not using the right word, um, how how you see their impact on the ability for commons to 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 exist and to flourish. Well, I think at, you could say there are at a more superficial level there are conflicts over certain political or policy uh, agendas, uh, and to that extent, of course, there is uh, opposition. But I think in terms of the deeper worldview of the type of society they want to build, uh, the faith in economic growth, the faith in consumerism as being uh, uh, satisfying human welfare, mm -hmm. those types of things, they're very deeply allied. And we know, of course, politically, mm -hmm. that uh, they're very tightly allied as well. And it's, you can see this when left-wing governments have taken over Bolivia, for example, or Chile, or Greece, and immediately um, international capital uh, closes ranks to prevent any alternative from being developed. Right. So there is a very tight linkage. Right. Um, and then I'd also love to, I mean, it, it is, I think we see it, and um, we see it, but we often, it's, it's really interesting to me to frame it in, in terms of impacts to a commons, as, as you've understood it. The other note that I'd love to start off with before we, we, we open it up is um, you talked a lot about, and I'm, I'm really um, interested in this, and I'm actually going to kind of ask what your thought are. So you talk a lot about relation, and uh, we think a lot about transaction versus relation. And I feel like, and I feel this personally and also professionally, but probably more personally, that our culture has become one that's embedded in transaction. Mm -hmm. And so ever, ever since, you know, and I think, you know, technology has, has prioritized this in terms of our interface with it. Uh, I want to be more critical about technology and its, its values versus the values of commons. But I also think everything from our, our, our public systems to our social systems, they really prioritize transaction. It's really hard to find that out. So uh, I was wondering if you could talk about um, what, what you see as some of the, the ways that relation, I mean, you mentioned it briefly, but um, how much you think a culture that has become so transactional, and again, speaking in generalizations, what, what way can the commons really push back against that? Well, that's, that's a big question, but I, it's precisely the question in the sense that I think many people, especially the younger generation, are choking on the transactional culture, which has no uh, intrinsic commitments because everything's exchange value and price. Right. And so there's a deep cynicism or alienation that results from that kind of a culture. And I think I do a lot of work in Europe where I think the commons has greater resonance and deeper uh, tradition with a lot of other collective action or the welfare state there. And there, um, there's a greater sense of looking to the commons as a way to have new conversations about post-capitalist society. Uh, because they've, been, they've had a socialist president in uh, France, Syriza, the left-wing coalition, one in Greece, and they're seeing that a lot of the traditional party politics and uh, left-wing approaches are simply not getting us to where we need to go. And I guess the chaser in this is climate change. Uh, so I think there's a lot of open discussion about well, how can we have, for example, commons-based finance that's embedded in the community and 0% interest? And it opens up a whole different set of dynamics than uh, how do we repay capital. 
no, it's, it, it is fascinating. And, and um, not that I don't love my institution, but working in higher education, you feel this, <laughs> you feel this tension, you know, every day as you come into the university about its prior, what it prioritizes versus what, what they, the narrative of what should happen at a place. Well, and I think it's because there's a, an apparent certainty or almost a fundamentalism towards these quantitative metrics or uh -huh. money. Whereas there's a greater uncertainty or ambiguity about relationships and how they evolve, right. even though I think, as we've seen in many contexts, they're far, I don't, I don't want to say, well, I would say far more creative and generative because they go to places that the market often doesn't go because there might not be a short-term business plan for that. Right, right. You know? No, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so I'd love to uh, open it up if folks have questions. Uh, I know we've got a microphone right there. Uh, and please, we'd love to know your name and, and pronouns. Um, and and uh, you know, we'd love to hear questions about any or all of, of David's talk. Um, uh, so we can open it up now and kind of go around um, if anyone has one to start. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple. Thank you for taking the plunge. Thanks uh, for the talk. This was really, really inspiring. Um, so I recently left a role where I worked for an international NGO that was um, responsible for defining the greenhouse gas emissions accounting protocols for cities. And it was always the sort of bottom up, like this is the boom in the cities, this is how we account for your, your greenhouse gases. Um, I came to realize that a lot of what we were doing it borrowed a lot or mimicked kind of the state and market ways of accounting that I, mm -hmm. I started to find in practice was, um, or in effect was exclusionary to really empowering local institutions, individuals mm -hmm. from being involved in, in creating the solutions. So, and, and I started thinking about this as, well, community missions are really more of a, a common bad that we do. And I wonder if there's um, anything that, that you can comment on the, the framework of commons for rather than sort of optimizing common goods, but minimizing common bads? Well, there's a phrase in Silicon Valley that you should eat your own dog food, meaning what you produce, you should eat. And when you are responsible for that and you cannot externalize costs, you tend to produce a more holistic answer. So I think in a gen as a general response to your, your question, I think that helps um, take account of things that markets often shunt elsewhere and then expect the regulatory system to ineffectually post hoc deal with, and not very well. Um, in terms of specific greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, we could talk in any number of arenas about that, but I think having greater local and neighborhood control over renewables, uh, having even stakeholder trusts for energy the way Alaska does for a portion of its uh, oil, uh, the, the Alaska Permanent Fund, and other types of institutions like that that help mutualize the gain, minimize the externalities, localize in a place-based way the control, uh, and thereby uh, minimize the consolidation and abuse of power would all be positive steps. And I think the commons can help actualize some of those. There are some rudimentary examples but in energy, but we have a lot of way, a long way to go there. Thanks. Uh, do, you have, do you have a question behind? I, uh, my name's uh, Natty, he, him, his. I, I hesitate because I'm confused and I don't know how to ask because I don't know how to understand. So, uh, to a, a short version, I'll, and I'll maybe you can use how round as an example, is how literally this works, a commons. So how round is a theater commons. Um, uh, and s so I, um, I assume people make money by working at how round <laughs> and needs to make more money, like to f stay offering these monitors and uh, water bottles, um, <laughs> uh, which sounds to, I think it might be a nonprofit. I don't know if that's true. Um, and if that's true, there are some 
speaking about nonprofit boards and your talk. And so I'm, I, there's, is this a hybrid? So I, I am like, how does these worlds interact um, in a quite like literal way if I wanted to leave here and start a commons or be a part of one? Well, I would start by saying there's no pure commons to the extent that, after all, capitalist uh, economy is ubiquitous and we all need to put food on the table. So to that extent, I don't think we should aspire to being uh, monks in the monastery. And I don't think that's a requirement of the commons either. Uh, I do think the commons is more like a dimmer switch where some will be brighter than others. Uh, and I think that people are constantly trying to find workarounds to prevent governing through money, whether it's transactional or simply the board that holds all the cards and can take their game if they want to go away. So it's a matter of different increments by which one regains greater bottom-up participatory control. And uh, yes, in the instance of HowlRound or a lot of other nonprofits, there's a, a, a value to that coordinating function, uh, which I suppose it's transactional in the sense that I take this job or not, but much of it, of course, is, I think, more mission and social driven. Uh, so the point is, to, I think, try to move as far as one can in that direction. And certainly in terms of uh, its engagement with the theater and arts and culture world, it has been deliberately empowering of the bottom-up expression and uh, on its own terms, setting the terms of, of engagement with each other, as opposed to we, the experts from on high, uh, deciding this is how it should be. So as two stark comparisons, I would suggest HowlRound is a rather different type of commons, albeit as officially, legally a nonprofit. I might add that the legal forms for empowering commons are non-existent to hostile, and most of them are workarounds. The Creative Commons licenses were a, a private contract license workaround to copyright law, which has no provisionings for it, and you don't expect Congress to come up with something like that. The same with the general public license for software, the same with community land trust law, you know, so workarounds is the norm for legally empowering commons, and we have a long way to go for in that front. But I hope I'm speaking a little bit to your your concerns. That makes total sense. <laughs> Thank you, Natty. We have a question up in the, oh, we have one here, and then we'll go to the back, sorry. Sure, so actually, uh, my name is Abigail Norman, and my question is really another form of yours, uh, in fact, she, her, hers. Um, I'm the director of an art center in Boston, the Elliott School, Craft School. Um, and I struggle, I, I think a way that I might phrase my question to you is when we are working in a, in a self created community, so we have 100 teachers and 1,000 students uh, and a strong sense of community, and yet I'm devoted to the uh, I'm determined to pay the artists for every second that they work, mm -hmm. uh, including things that <coughs> the organization used to uh, take for granted as volunteer hours. Um, and I struggle with how do we create a sense of community that is somehow not uh, at the same time poisoned by you know, the transaction of money. In an unrelated note, and interestingly, you also brought this up, we, uh, in order to um, behave in the marketplace in a way that's uh, sustainable, we're, um, we're uh, faced with peers who all are funded through philanthropic dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the only way that we can charge people fees and our school partners and libraries and so on fees that make sense is with those philanthropic dollars. Those philanthropic dollars come from the wealthy and we're uh, obliged to court the wealthy to sit on our boards, which after all are our decision-making bodies. How do you live in a world without just saying, oh, well, there's a workarounds, how do you conceptualize and philosophize a future in which we navigate these contradictions, especially in a, uh, well, really in any field, it doesn't have to be the arts, it could be agriculture or really anything. Thank you. That's, that's a good and perennial question about markets and art, which you know, I guess my first introduction to a lot of that was Lewis Hyde's book on the gift, which does, I think, a, 
a wonderful expression of how art is this, um, well, he later wrote some books about the commons as well. Uh, the book Common as Air is a, a fantastic follow through about how this free, meaning freedom to share and collaborate is an essential part of the creative act and com creative communities. And uh, yes, finding ways for the market culture to, for an artist to have a livelihood remains a perennial challenge. I would just say there are markets and there are markets. There's a lot of artist collectives that have been able to empower artists to have more control than say a gallery system, which might be preying upon individual artists. And there are ways to have different types of relationships with the market. But um, I think the alternative is simply to al allow the ultra marketization of everything through expansive copyright controls, which shuts down the creativity, uh, you know, when two seconds of sound or illegal sampling and so forth. I don't have a, a, an omnibus answer for you, but I do think there are vehicles for empowering artists to take greater control both of their artistic life as well as how they interact with markets. Um, could I just follow up on that for a sec? Because I, I think it's I think these questions are really interesting, and I'm wondering if if there's anything we can learn for. I know you mentioned this in your talk, and again in an answer about post about, about pushing a post capitalist approach to commons, and I'm wondering if there's anything we can learn from Europe. Understand that the comparisons are not um, necessarily you know there's a lot of different ideological and issues of, of ethnicity and diversity and, and political and socioeconomic structures. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what post-capitalism is and maybe are there other systems that we could learn for because the questions here seem to me like they have a very particular grounding in, in what the, you, the our capitalistic uh, and our commodified realities, our market-based realities are. Well, I guess two things that jump to mind are, are your needs met only through market exchange and do we, do, do we require economic growth the way the system of capital and, uh, and lending, mm -hmm. so debt and equity, require? Right. So for example, in a number of transition, there's a transition town movement, which is basically argues that because we're at a point of peak oil and arguably peak growth, they want to relocalize as much of the economy to be self-sufficient and more stable and resilient as possible. So this entails, in some of those circles, trying to devise different ways of financing the system. Uh, there's a group called Local Capital in Sweden, for example, that has devised some zero interest lending. It's basically micro lending to within the community that tries to escape the imperatives for, of growth that debt and equity tend to require. And they tr by decommodifying, uh, and meeting relationships, uh, I hesitate to use the word barter because that is such a stigmatic, stigmatized word in economics, but through all sorts of social relationships the way we see in everything from open source to traditional communities, uh, you can meet needs without having those money relationships. I know the Double Edge Theater <coughs> near where I live in Western Massachusetts has a very robust relationship with its local community, which helps de decommodify having to raise tens of thousands of dollars more to buy what it needs. So it's these types of things that open the door for both a more deeply embedded social community, but not having the financial burdens. Um, my name, oh, this is your left. My name is Sumi Day. I'm actually one of the media design students. And this is a question I've been thinking about a lot as I anxiously think about my own thesis project. Um, so thinking about the system of government governance in an American context where our societies are unfortunately very fragmented, how do we create mutual care and concern for common spaces? Um, because we all hold different spaces near and dear to our hearts. And even in the example that you provided, we see the way that Aboriginal communities inject meaning differently into certain spaces, um, much differently than a Western community might. So say, state your question again, please. Oh, sorry. Um, so basically thinking about the system of governance in an American context, which is very fragmented, how do we create mutual care and concern for so many different common spaces, considering we have 
we all hold different spaces near and dear to our hearts. Well, in some ways, I could turn your question around and say that's an advantage. The people who want to take care of the river, those who want to, young farmers who want to take care of the land in more responsible ways, those who want to take care of public spaces, I think all of them could and should have a role. I mean, we see the state chartering corporations <coughs> to do their work ostensibly because chartering corporations serves the public good by promoting market activity. I don't see why we couldn't charter certain self-organized commons to take care of certain resources that have public value as well. Um, in some ways, that kind of stewardship is needed as opposed to just quarantine it as a, as a wilderness. So I think any number of people who care about a resource, we see a lot of people who care about wildlife and uh, preserving certain types of landscapes, the Appalachian Trail Club, who are uh, functioning in that capacity. I think they could be empowered and s basically serve a public function in a way that the regulatory state often has trouble doing because it doesn't have the resources or it approaches it through this bureaucratic or legalistic system as opposed to through care. And care has to take place at the appropriate scale. Uh, it can't just take place in this universalistic way. Even though I want to uh, accent, it's important to have these uh, larger structures and infrastructures to facilitate care at a smaller scale. But by all means, let's take feminist economics seriously and give enabling structures for care to occur. And I think that will have all sorts of benign and constructive ramifications that are otherwise lost in market externalities. We have a question right here. Hi, uh, my name is Liren. I take him his. Um, I guess my question is similar to a couple of ones that have already been asked, but I'm wondering how can individuals contribute to this movement? And like more specifically, me as a college student, I don't think I'm directly involved in any commons movement. So I'm just wondering like how I like what my role is in your theory of change. Well, I, I think there's two levels. One is I think there's commenting happening all over the place. It's just not culturally legible. We don't name it and therefore it has no value. It's a thousand points of light and forget it. Uh, not, that that, not that a thousand points of light is necessarily commenting, but my point is we don't name it, and that's one reason I had that little discussion about vocabulary. But then second, I think many of us have talents and passions that for which there is a group that is engaged in some of this. Um, I, that's, I guess, the best advice I have, at, this, at least at, at this stage of a lot of people thinking about commons because there are not the clearinghouses or the on-ramps for a lot of commons right now, but I do think there are many groups that are doing serious work in that regard, whether named or unnamed. Um, and part of the necessity that I see is to start to name this so that it can be have more consequence in public discussion and in culture and people seeing, oh, there's an opportunity that I could play to this larger enterprise. Thank you. Um, we have a question over here. Yeah, coming right <coughs> along. Hi, my name is Sariva, um, she series. Um, my question is, in your opinion, is there a way to bring this idea of commoning into systems of higher education, which mm. are typically transactionally based, where students expect to pay an amount of money and be trained to go into the world and be able to earn money, and where there are levels of power and people that are hired as experts to pass along information? Is there a way of re-looking at that? Well, I mean, you point to a, a deep structural problem. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's I think the I'm best- I'm going to leave the room first. <laughs> <laughs> the best that one could hope is to identify strategic openings for making headway. I mean, just la this is top of mind for me, but just last week I met with 20 or 25 PhD students, grad students in Amsterdam, mm 
who, many of whom are studying the commons. And they were frustrated that they didn't have more means both within their university as well as to reach into the genuine communities to have impact. And their, their answer is to start an international network of grad students and PhD candidates and their advisors, a, a network to start to get that conversation going. So a lot of these things, I think, then unfold in unpredictable ways that, oh, this opportunity or that opportunity. But in terms of your, your question, I think there's, there's a lot of different openings that could and should be exploited more. Open access scholarly communications and publishing. I mean, I think it's scandalous that administrators have not opened that door wider and funded it properly, and how librarians uh, are often the caboose on that, or you know, still talking about strict copyright instead of how we can share the resources that we taxpayers have already paid for, et cetera. So that's one arena. There's a number of others, but I don't. They may or may not speak to your larger structural concern, which uh, you know, that's a big conversation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that question. Um, hi, I was hoping you'd talk a bit about, um, I guess, copyright and how commenting can kind of improve that. Because uh, on the one hand, I definitely am disheartened by Disney's push to renew the or extend the length of copyright renewal processes and all those sorts of things. Um, but I'm I'm an artist, and I I make things that are I don't want to say easy to steal. Um, but easy to reproduce, and mm -hmm. um, how do we make sure people are being supported, can have a livelihood in some capacity without copywriting, uh, you know, folk songs and, you know, traditions? Well, the short, perhaps unsatisfactory answer is I think we need alternative ways to finance artists, to, to pay artists, because to the extent that they're roped in to copyright and their market transactions is the chief way to do it, they're always going to be eclipsed by the superstars who constitute 1% of their field. And I, so I think that, and moreover, they're going to be artistically constrained because they won't have access to the things they want to emulate or borrow from. Uh, you know, this is a perennial issue of how artists get paid. But I don't think through the market in the straight up ways that favor the big corporations, is going to help the individual artist, except those brilliant superstars. So uh, I think artist collectives, I think um, you know, ways to uh, assure greater control over the resource. And I suppose copyright has historically been the means to do that. But increasingly, that's a dead letter uh, unless you have a, you know, an army of lawyers to help you anyway. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't really have a, a truly satisfying answer to me as well, because uh, there are so many socially vital functions that the market won't support. Um, and so we need to find other ways. We look at academia, you know, they're not paid through the market as such, they're paid through their institutions. I think we could have institutions that could support artists. People have talked about, you know, copyright is a, um, a government monopoly uh, that why shouldn't there be some slice of that that's taken off and put into a trust fund to support artists? I think it makes, you know, on the merits, perfectly legitimate sense. Politically, it's not likely to go very fast. Uh, but, you know, help me, <laughs> help you to, to find some new ways to fund artists. Yeah, it, it you know it does seem like listening to this and and between artists and higher education, you know, it it often seems not it's not cynical, but it, we know when you, it often seems like the the structures that be are so powerful. I mean, no, in higher education, it's almost like we say administrators, and I don't think I'm gonna get there's no I hope there's no administrators in here tonight, but <laughs> it does like that the narrative of the market is actually it's taken such a hold that that like. But see, that's why, why it's important to right. carve out these spaces right. as existence proofs of an alternative way of doing things. Yes. And that has unforeseen complications down the road, the way right. open source software has grown and grown and grown. Right. And that's right. And those spaces cannot be kind of counter-revolutionary because the, 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 the Institute of Education gets it, and so they'll carve out 
spaces that they call common. They like they label it commons and they talk about common, but it's really all within the this kind of marketized mechanism right. to keep. So they really have to be kind of they ha you have to kind of go around the institution itself sometimes. There there are some worthy experiments in institutional innovation for education and co-learning uh, that are commons oriented. There's a if you go to the my book uh, patternsofcommoning.org online, there's an essay on a variety of different experiments. But you know, um, there's a lot of capital in big ed higher education. <laughs> yeah, but it does, it does, I mean, the, the notion what you mentioned that kind of generative bottom-up experimentation and different value sets, th those don't lose their value. They just need to be prioritized at a real, at a real basic level. And in a certain way, they become the battering ram. Right. Because when, th when you have the moral integrity and authority the way certain artistic troops do, yeah. you know, and if that can't be bought and they play on their own terms, I mean, that's, that's an important yeah. beachhead for advancing something. Yeah. No, I agree. How are we, you, you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that, I didn't know what sign this was. Is there a secret sign? <laughs> Well, maybe this should be the last, this could also be the last question <laughs> if we wanted it to be until I move to the reception. Um, my question is, you spoke a little bit in your presentation about um, how you feel artists um, and folks who work in arts and culture are uniquely positioned to contribute to um, commons and acts of commoning. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more based on yeah. your experience? I think people don't appreciate that commons, commoning is an embodied, situated process. And it's not just about cognitive knowledge, and it's about the human condition. I started getting involved in the commons as a Washington person. I worked for Nader, uh, and I was into it at the policy and the economic level. But over the past 20 years, increasingly, I've seen this as a deep human mystery about our relationality, our relationship to the earth, and I think artists have a special voice in speaking to that uh, in a way that's not just right side of the brain. And uh, in some ways, express things that everybody's feeling but hasn't been expressed, except through art. So that's why I think the role of artists and cultural organizations is so important. And by framing it as a commons enterprise, as opposed to a wannabe market enterprise, you have a greater integrity of vision in pursuing that. Okay. Not the last question. All right, this is your fault. Uh, my name is Ron Malice. I run a nonprofit on the arts, art in public places. Uh, when I got going in this, I went to a presentation by the woman who at the time was head of Art Place America, uh, Carol Coletta, and she talked about the key criteria that Art Place uses to evaluate grant applications. The primary criterion was how the applicant deals with the question, what is it we can do together that we can't do separately? Mm -hmm. And that has informed pretty much everything that I've been doing since then, including developing a concept called the Arts Commons, mm. which physically is essentially a repurposed shipping container serving as a black box for performances, installations, mm. whatever. And, you know, it's gradually getting to where we wanted to go. And I have to say, too, that the notion of the arts commons was because of uh, this person here and the uh, theater commons. Mm. And I said, well, why not an arts commons? Mm. But this business about what is it we can do together that we can't do separately, I mean, granted, it's getting it down to a micro level. But that's, I think, where you got to go. Otherwise, this becomes absolutely theoretical and rhetorical and, and whatever. So uh, in posing that question, in connection with the notion overall of what you're talking about, a fair, free, and alive commons. Mm -hmm. Start with that. The other subsidy, uh, sort of the subsequent question, of course, is who is we? Mm. So I'll leave that alone. Well, that, that's a fair enough question. Um, who is we? Because I think, well, let me just say, when Silk and I were thinking about commons, a lot of people said, oh, what's the boundary around it? And we came to the realization that there's not a boundary in a property sense, there's a semi-permeable membrane as a living tissue, like the blood-brain barrier. So the bad stuff gets screened out and the good stuff can get in. And to that extent, uh, 
you have a more living, breathing relationship with other people. And it's not it's like, you're out, I'm in. Uh, and I think you can be more flexible the way most traditional commons are a little more flexible and situational about such questions. So, I mean, that's not entirely an answer, but you, I think you see where I'm driving, what I'm driving at, that uh, people who contribute to the commons <coughs> should have pre preferential entitlement to the benefits uh, because that matters as a moral and ethical issue but it shouldn't be so hermetically sealed like a club good, as economists would talk about it. By definition, open-ended. Yes, it, it, and the open-ended aspect is what life's all about. Hmm. Yes. Hi, Sumro Akut. I am um, struggling to make a great deal of sense out of what you have given us which to me is at the abstract level, and I'm dying to get you to talk about a few examples of commons and tell us what makes them a common and how they differ from each other, and they're all commons. So just to be very concrete. Well, um, we could talk about uh, the the Asequia water irrigation ditches in New, New Mexico, which the indigenous people, uh, native-born people there manage. And it's an area of great aridity, not much water. And in contrast to the local developers who suck as much water away as they can, these communities all have to participate in digging and cleaning the ditches in which the water that they use to irrigate is used. They uh, allot it based on how much land or other needs of that family, and they make sure they don't go over the carrying capacity of how much water there is. And this is a way that, in a very arid way, they've used a very finite resource to meet people's needs without more, 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 more. Now, that's maybe a, a prototypical commons in the sense that there's a shared resource that is stewarded, sustainably managed, through very specific localized rules that are perceived by all its participants as fair and meet their needs. Um, so that, that's, I'm just spinning out an example for you. But you can see that kind of stewardship occur. The resource might differ like in software code where it's not finite and the issue is not is people, are people taking too much? The issue is are people adding bad code or being mischievous and therefore we need to curate the code in a way that makes sense for the evolution of the project. And some people will disagree and say, no, I'm gonna fork the code and go my own way. I'll take whatever code is there which can be taken and I'm just gonna move it in a different direction. So that's, there's a whole culture in the software world for managing shareable code, which is very different from the way Microsoft or you know, Oracle or some of the big tech companies do it where you are get given this little bit of code to program and you give it to someone else and it's all proprietary and nobody can share it or reuse it, et cetera. So it'll, those are very different examples. It's the terms of how they're similar, we use this patterns methodology which is based on recurrent problems that a commons will face. Recurrent problems, decision making, who's in and who's out. Uh, sharing of knowledge, punishing people who break the rules. And we looked at many different commons and saw these regularities of the way people tended to deal with it. Now, of course, it's gonna be different in New Zealand from Canada in terms of certain specifics, but there are certain levels of generality that one can make without saying this is the universal rule. So that was our methodology for trying to identify commonalities of commons as a social system, which is very different from the way the economists approach it as the unowned resource, uh, ocean, space, the internet. Um, right, so, so I think that's, we're gonna transition, Jamie, so I, I'd like to just thank you. I mean, in the, you know, it's really not a question, but you really make me think as we pose it forward is in digital culture, can commons exist in completely mediated environments? Maybe not something to, Maybe something that we can um, 
discuss over the reception. So I'm going to turn it back to Jamie, who's eager to transition us. And yeah, if we can all just give um, Paul and David a round of applause, please. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank um, you. And thanks to all of you for coming and for having such a, a, a vibrant discussion. We are now going to transition, uh, for those who care to stick around, we'll be selling some books. Um, we have some snacks and drinks. You're welcome to stick around and keep the conversation going. Um, and if, uh, if you have to head out, that's fine too. But thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks again to Center for Economic Democracy for helping us put this together and the Emerson Engagement Lab and the MA in Media Design Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.